Hi everyone, and thanks for uh, taking a listen to what I've got to say today. Um, my name is Gary Evans, and I work with a number of authors around the world, primarily focused on ancient history, ancient mysteries, and ancient sites wisdom. I'm also a conference and um, tour operator. Anything that gets um, people that are interested in, in these kind of subjects together because not only is it important to, um, to follow the work of these authors, but also to meet up and um, discuss them with like-minded people. And, and it's also helped me uh, grow as an individual. So it's a great joy to um, investigate these mysteries for my work, represent the authors that inspire me, and um, share journeys around the world with people to these places that fascinate us, that are these intriguing mysteries. And from spending time visiting um, a, lot, a lot of time in Egypt, I've gone through um, Peru and Bolivia with Brian Forster and through Central America. I've spent time with uh, Maria Wheatley, who's a good friend of mine in the Stonehenge environment. And so I've started to build up a picture of these ancient um, megalithic sites, pyramids and the, the temples, sacred space and... Um, Power places is, is the term that I prefer to call it. Places where we go, um, e and even today, they can perhaps um, have this kind of palpable atmosphere there. And so that leads us into the, the subject that I'm going to be discussing today, which is um, a site in the Stonehenge environment called the Devil's Den. And it's a site with a bit of a scary name. And just to orientate us a little bit, here's Stonehenge. We're going to be up here. Um, at the Devil's Den, and over here is London. So it's only about 40 minutes north of Stonehenge. And when you start exploring that landscape, you realise that all the way um, up to the Devil's Den, there are ancient sites. It's just covered the Wiltshire area. And um, Stonehenge is, is certainly not the only amazing place over there. And I, w I went um, to the Devil's Den, and I had a... An interesting rediscovery, one of my kind of uh, claims to fame, I think, from visiting ancient sites. And so it's definitely a real pleasure to discuss, discuss the site today. And, of course, when we're trying to go back um, thousands and thousands of years, we don't know the original name of the site. But what we can do is try to sort of dig back a bit into at least a recent history and see what the site's... Um, have looked like because even over the last um, hundred years many of these places such as Stonehenge have been transformed dramatically by reconstruction and an interesting book I found was this one Ancient Stones and Old Postcards so we're trying to go back to the to how the sites originally looked and in this book we have a nice little section on the the Devil's Den and that's how the, the site looks today so if we're going to start somewhere, we can start with folklore and, and quite modern folklore in comparison to the age of the site. So probably um, this has only been around for the last few hundred years. But they say, the Devil's Den is an impressive dolmen on the Wiltshire Downs, not far from Marlborough. Its 10 foot square capstone appears to be precariously balanced on the uprights. And indeed, it did once fall and was re-erected in 1921. The Devil's Den is said to be haunted by a large white dog with glowing eyes and striking red ears. And, um, but, and so where they went from that is the Devil's Den. Um, we think this name has come from um, probably uh, early Christians in the area. That's about as far as it's, they've been able to trace it back. And uh, one other local tradition says that if water was poured into the hollows on the capstone a demon would come in the dark and drink it. So it seems like the local folklore um, was trying to scare people away from this site for whatever reason, which is the total opposite to how I feel when I, I visit there and I, and I go there with Maria Wheatley um, fairly regularly because it's a really inspiring place. So it's one of these, these situations where people are being put off because of a scary name, but if we go there... In fact, it's, we do find that there's a total opposite experience, and you can read in, into that and the name uh, what you will. But what I discovered 
while I was there um, was that in the central capstone, there's this um, circular hollow. And from spending a lot of time in Egypt, I've, I'm interested in looking at sites with uh, archaeoacoustic properties. And as I was looking up at the capstone and this hole, I realised that it was almost perfectly a head-shaped hole. The same kind of depth, and in fact, when I put my head inside it, it's almost like a helmet, and it comes up to here. And that was um, was interesting to me. And luckily, I had a kind of hooded top on the first time I went there, because it was rather dirty in the hole. I mean, it's been there uh, quite a few thousand years, you can imagine. And so I put my head in, and it came up to here. And using similar practices as I do in Egypt, um, you get this very strong acoustic effect when you um, do some chanting of the kind of vowel sounds. And in fact, it's a crystalline stone um, of a sandstone variety. So you are vibrating crystal very close, and it's only about this far away around your head. So you get this really kind of intense feeling, and it's quite special. So normally when I visit the site, I say to people, well, let's just check in with yourself as you're approaching. This is your kind of, this is how you feel now. That's your baseline. And let's compare that feeling to when we're walking away from the site and see how you feel. And, and I would definitely have this kind of uplifted feeling, more sort of joy and um, feel a lot happier than when I enter the site. That's the common pattern I see. Not only does it affect me, it has um, affected those I've visited the site with. I've also um, directed a few people to the site. I've had a few inquiries. People have been interested when I've discussed the subject in other interviews. And I've sent them the directions, and they've got back in touch and said they also had an amazing experience. It definitely has um, its sense of place still, despite the reconstruction. And um, it's, it's in a wonderful landscape. Now, the archaeologists tell us that the, um, the structure that we see is the remains of a long barrow, and that was possibly extended sort of two, 200 feet behind it, much like a structure down the road near Avebury called West Kennet Long Barrow, which is one of my favourites. But I've discussed this subject, and um, there isn't any real evidence for it ever being a long barrow. It could have been um, a dolmen structure with a few more stones attached to it, as we see today. There, are, there is evidence, um, as you might be able to see in the video clip that's shared, that there's stones inside it that have been pushed in. On the periphery of the site, there is also a number of um, megalithic remains that at some point have been destroyed, which is, is very sad to see. And so it appears from early reports that this structure, this dolmen we're going to call it today, was one of possibly two or three others and if you can imagine the site, it kind of comes down like this into a valley. And that there was one structure, then along further was another structure, and then possibly a third structure. Now, I wasn't able to find any evidence for the capstones for the others. Um, I do plan another investigation up the valley in the future. But if the capstones of those existed and we found one of these holes that you can fit your head into then um, it would definitely be more um, evidence that my theory is on the right track. Other things that I can add about the hole in the capstone, it, it does appear visually um, that it's dead centre, so it's not kind of damage that's in, a, in an odd position, so it does seem like it was an intended feature of the site, and that's um, something to know. And one of the um, things that I wanted to to make people aware of today was that there is archaeoacoustic evidence around the world at these ancient sites and there's emerging sciences looking at them and I've been in contact um, with a team at Stanford University they're doing some work at Chavin in Peru looking at how sound was directed inside one of these um, well either you could call it a burial chamber or um, an underground temple and they're, they're starting to see that, in fact, they've made the engineering and pointed the stones, so it does direct the sound into this one um, place of the structure. There's also the work of um, at UCLA, the Mindfulness Research Centre, that started to see um, 
strong indications through their um, various experiments that the hemispheres of the brain balance between about it's around 110 hertz. And um, I've just been reading uh, another paper that was mentioned on the um, Ancient Origins website, and you can find that under the hypogeum of Hal Salfina, an unknown race with elongated skulls. Now, in, in the article, there was a link through to archaeoacoustics analysis and ceremonial customs in an ancient hypogeum by Paolo de Bertolis. And, and so I, I went looking into this gentleman, and as it turned out, he is a very good friend of one of my very close friends. And so within the next few days, we're going to be having a Skype discussion about his paper and the evidence that he's been looking at in Malta at the Hypogeum, which is one of the next sites I'm intending to visit because it has very strong uh, similarities to the Great Pyramid and the King's Chamber. And that's where I've been really doing a lot of my own research and researching with groups on sound and the effects on consciousness. So it's an exciting time. The Devil's Den is one of my local uh, favourites for archaeoacoustics, and I encourage everybody um, to investigate the sites that are close to them. It is important to go out into the field and investigate places and, and make our own minds up, because if I hadn't done that at the Devil's Den, I wouldn't have started to see this local connection with archaeoacoustics. So that was um, my brief overview of the site. The other um, thing that I did want to point out from this paper by uh, Paolo is that there is um, this emerging evidence that our ancestors knew about sound and the effects on consciousness. And so he, he said in his paper um, that it's suggestive that the, there was an understanding of this resonance phenomenon and that the ancient population was able to inf influence the perception of the human body to obtain different states of consciousness without the use of drugs or other chemical substances. And I think that's really a very important point. And there is uh, also a power of group sound. The balancing of the male and the female voices is an important aspect at some of these sites. And also by us coming together and not acting as individuals, but acting in groups. Uh, and some of these things you could um, take part in perhaps at a local yoga or meditation center if you've got one close by. And also sound healing events. My, my normal advice is if you're interested in these subjects, do a Google search, groups like Meetup, things like that. Um, you might be surprised that there's these sound healing events close by. And just give it a try. And the people that I've introduced this subject to are now coming back to me, giving me some wonderful feedback. Because when you feel this resonance of sounds and it interacts with the body, it's very surprising at how powerful the effects are. So that's um, hopefully given people a little something to think of. If you want to join me, um, we've got a number of tours coming up that are on my website, infiniteconnections.co.uk. We're off to Egypt next month, and I've got a tour of uh, Ireland and England with Maria Wheatley in July. So we've aimed it for July. Hopefully the British weather will be accommodating for any international uh, visitors. But we'll have a wonderful time traveling uh, across the top half of Ireland to places like Newgrange and as far as um, the Giant's Causeway in the north. We've got private time in uh, Stonehenge, which is always a joy, just to feel the power there right in the centre of Stonehenge and um, a great spot for meditation. And then after that, we'll be in um, Peru and Bolivia with Brian Forster. So it's going to be a busy year. And, um, and also in July this year, with uh, another client of mine, Lucy Wyatt, I'm organising the Eternal Knowledge Festival um, which is the second event that we've run. The first one was in Suffolk in 2012. This time we're running at Greenwich University, and you can see that on the uh, Eternal Knowledge website. And we've got about 16 different speakers, um, so they'll be speaking and uh, workshops and some, some great um, gathering there, I'm sure. So thanks for your time.